here bringing Africa together. Africa's in back. Transforming Africa's trade. Accelerating the next generation of African businesses, we can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together. Africa's in bank, transforming Africa's trade. Transform together. 
We're bringing Africa together. Africsing Bank, transforming Africa's trade. <laughs> We are on a mission to transform our continent and empower African trade to thrive by accelerating the next generation of African businesses. We can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together. Africsing Bank, transforming Africa's trade. Accelerating the next generation of African businesses, we can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together. Africsing Bank, 
transforming Africa's trade. Accelerating the next generation of African businesses, we can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together. Africa Bank, transforming Africa's trade. of African businesses, we can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together. Africaxing Bank, transforming Africa's trade.
Africa's team back, transforming Africa's trade. We are on a mission to transform our continent and empower African trade to thrive by accelerating the next generation of African businesses. We can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together, Africing back, transforming Africa's trade. Thank you. 
We are on a mission to transform our continent and empower African trade to thrive by accelerating the next generation of African businesses. We can go stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together, Africa's in back, transforming Africa's trade. Um. We are on a mission to transform our continent. Thank you.
African trade to thrive by accelerating the next generation of African businesses. We can grow stronger, trade further, and transform together. We're bringing Africa together. Afrexing back, transforming Africa's trade. Do you know what's hiding in your business's data? Companies of all sizes use BigQuery to uncover new insights from their data, like cost savings, operational efficiencies, and new ways to grow revenue. BigQuery is Google Cloud's serverless, highly scalable cloud data warehouse at the core of Google's unified data cloud. BigQuery brings your data together in one place, even across clouds, for real-time insights that can reveal cost savings in your operations and supply chain all without the need to manage infrastructure. BigQuery Thank 
My name is Adibisi Akishilwe. Fantastic for coming. Thank you. We celebrate the 2023 annual lecture put together by the of Nigeria CIBN. 
We are excited you're here. May we all rise as we uh, of council. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. In the same vein, can we all... Salman is not there. Oh. We have a national answer. I shouldn't have disturbed. Yeah, Chairman. Good morning. Virus hmm? man is there now. You call him on now. They should be the cast. Hmm? CIB, first vice uh, president of CIB and for the opening prayer. Shall we pray? Uh, eternal Rock of Christ, we want to give thanks to you this morning. as an institute is wonderful sure, event this morning. We pray that you take preeminence control and uh, we want to continue to reign.
peace of progress and an advancement in our country. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May we be seated, please. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, traditional rulers, captains of industry, we want to say a very big welcome. Welcome to the CIBN 2020 annual lecture theme, unlocking the constraints in Africa's economic transformation, insights into the power of capital. Now, with a population of over 1.2 billion people in the continent, the potentials of this continent cannot be underplayed. Rich in capital, human, and natural resources. The very reason why we must have this conversation around unlocking the constraints to the continent's transformation agenda. Once again, I say a very big welcome to everyone here. My name is David Ubabudike. I will be your anchor for this beautiful event. Uh, let me begin by welcoming everyone. In no particular order, I want to say a very big welcome to uh, the President, Chairman in Council, Ken Opara, PhD, FCIB. I also want to welcome the Chairman of the occasion, uh, Mr. Adedotun Suleiman, MFR. A very big welcome to you. Distinguished guest, speaker of the event, uh, Professor Benedict Okechukorama, CON. FCIB. It's a big pleasure seeing you in person, sir. Very big welcome. I also want to acknowledge the presence of guests, uh, guest of honor, His Excellency Andy Yu Ping Liu, representative of Taipei Trade Office. So good to have you uh, with us this beautiful day. Uh, the managing director of NDIC, Mr. Asan Bell, uh, FCIB, and the executive uh, director of NC NDIC, ably represented. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. The first question, CIBN, Pius Deji, or Larry Baju, PhD, FCIB, you are highly welcome to uh, the event this uh, beautiful morning. Uh, the National Treasurer, CIBN, Mrs. Mujisola Asheru Bakari, FCIB, Registrar, CEO, uh, Aki Morakio, HCIB. Welcome, gentlemen. Highly revered. Bank's CEO, uh, Dr. Ebenezer Onyago, FCIB. A very big welcome to you. Uh, the chairman of the 2023 CIBN Annual Lecture Implementation Supervisory Committee and Group and Managing Director, CEO, Fidelity Bank PLC, Mrs. Ineka Onye, uh, Onyeli Ikbe, FCIB. Welcome to uh, this event this morning. Members of the CIB and Annual Lecture Implementation Supervisory Committee, uh, Marine Director, banks and other financial institutions. We say a very big welcome, distinguished members of the Governing Council of CIBN. We also welcome you this beautiful morning. All special guests here present, captains of industries and leaders of thoughts, uh, the past registrars, chief executive of executives of CIBN. Our regulators, directors of CIBN and the NDIC, we say a very big welcome. I see some of you here. I also want to say a very big welcome to the eminent members of the diplomatic community, uh, DGs and MDs, CEOs of ministries, department agencies, presidents of professional bodies here present. You are very welcome to this August event. Fellow associates, honorary senior members, the microfinance, certified bankers, and all other categories of memberships of the CIBN. A very big welcome. Members of the academia, we see you here. You are also welcome. Uh, imminent members of the banking community, management, and staff of CIBN. Esteemed audience joining us on the virtual platform from across the globe. A very big welcome. I also see some uh, traditional rulers here. I say a very big welcome to all of you as well. Gentlemen of the press, my constituency, welcome. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very big welcome to all of you. I think it's a perfect place to give us a round of applause. In spite of all the challenges that the nation's economy is faced with, we could still make it here 
and still have some smiles on our faces. I think we should at least applaud ourselves uh, for being here. We made it here. Welcome, welcome. At this point in time, I invite the president and uh, chairman of council, CIBN, Kenabara, PhD, FCIB, for the opening uh, remark. Can we put our hands together for the president? A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. The chairman of 2023 CIBN um, annual lecture, our own elder, Mr. Dedoto Suleiman, MFR. The distinguished speaker for today of um, 2023 annual lecture, Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, CON FCIB. The managing director of um, NDIC, MD of Nexim Bank here, the first vice president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, Prof. Solare Waju, F FCIB, PRD, the national treasurer, Mrs. Moji Solab. Bakare, FCIB, the chairman of the um, body of uh, past president, represented here, and other members of um, our referred past presidents that are here present, chairman of body of bank CEO, Ebenezer Onyagu the chairman of CIBN annual lecture, implementation supervisory committee, and the group managing director of um, Fidelity Bank, Mrs. Onyal Ibe. Captains of industries that are here, Roy Fathers, the Christian communities, the Muslim and the spiritual fathers, that are here present, managing directors of banks, former deputy governor of Central Bank, and then other guests that are here present. Let me not forget um, the representative of um, the Taiwan Trade Mission in Nigeria, my very good friend, His Excellency Andy. Please permit me to rest on um, protocol that the MC has observed. I'll go ahead and welcome you for this um, great occasion. Gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this auspicious session, the 20th chapter of the Chartered Institute. Be aware, the CIBN annual lecture is a public policy forum initiated by the Institute to acquaint members of the public with developments on topical issues economy. It also provides platform for industry holders, nice experiences, and exchange ideas. 
temporary issues that are of consequence. This year's edition of the lecture is uniquely different because this year the institute is celebrating its 68th anniversary of upholding professionalism in banking and supporting the economy. Therefore, the choice of the guest speaker is very deliberate. And I'm sure that the quality of attendance today speaks to it. Therefore, welcome you all to this event. Esteemed audience, permit me at this juncture to recognize the presence of the chairman of this event, a consummate professional business leader and the boardroom guru, Mr. Adedotu Suleiman, MFA. He serves as the chairman of board of companies, including Cadbury. We are very proud of you. You've dedicated over four decades of your life to the growth and transformation of business corporations in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. We appreciate your contribution and we are indeed honored to have you in our midst. Distinguished guests, the lecture of today titled Unlocking the Constraints to Africa's Economic Transformation Insights into the Power of Capital will be delivered by our distinguished guest speaker, His Excellency, Professor Benedict O.K. Orama, C.O.N. S.I.B. President and Chairman, Board of Directors, African Export in Bank, Afrexit. Professor Rama is an ablent scholar, a visionary, a transformational leader who has demonstrated creativity, enterprise, and commitment, ladies and gentlemen, under his watch. Afrexit has become a foremost driver of economic transformation through implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement after. Professor Rama has led the creation of innovative instruments to support the development of strong and interconnected continental financial system, working with the African Union and after Secretariat, Afrexim batted the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System to enable intra-African trade and payment in African currencies, paving the way for achieving annual service of about $5 billion in payment charges by Africa. This is very, very important because if you have to make payment that you the transaction in Ghana. You don't need to talk about dollar. And that's what the Pan-African payment system is geared towards achieving. In Nigeria, the impact of Afrexim has been monumental. Afrexim has contributed immensely to strengthening the Nigerian financial sector and has supported the growth of the private sector. For instance, the bank recently commissioned the first African Quality Assurance Center in Ogun State, Nigeria, as part of the initiative to develop world-class
economic transformation at the entire continent. As you may already know, the African continent represents 20% of the Earth's surface and is home to about 1.3 billion people, which will likely reach 2.5 billion by the year 2015. It boasts of 60% of the world's arable lands, large swaths of forests, 30% of the world reserve of mineral, and the youngest population in the world. Despite these riches and impressive demography, many African countries are still characterized by widespread poverty and inequality, coupled with mixed effects of limited access to quality education, health, nutrition, technology, funding, and innovation. Failure to tackle this issue could deprive a whole generation of Africans the opportunities to maximize their potential. This implies that Africa needs to invest heavily in human, cap in human capital, education, skills, and entrepreneurial development to ensure that its citizens have the knowledge and skill to drive economic growth and development. According to a report by World Bank, successful countries with the highest level of per capita wealth globally adopt the highest concentration of human capital. Therefore, the tide of Africa's brain drain must be reversed by creating a world-class education and research infrastructure that will keep the best minds of the, in the continent so that we will um, prevent the so-called um, the Japa syndrome. As talent is developed across the continent, investment in research, science, and innovation will increase dramatically across various sectors, including manufacturing, which will be a significant factor in helping Africa realize its development potential and narrow its income and welfare gap. To reposition Nigeria and indeed Africa are the part of economic growth and unparalleled transformation. The, critical, the criticality of capital cannot be overstressed. Access to capital will no doubt unlock the constraint to the economic transformation of Africa. I have no doubt that the idea that will be generated from this forum will no doubt assist policy makers, industry practitioners in formulating policies that will transform our economy and reposition our country on the path of economic prosperity. Esteemed audience, during my investiture as the 22nd president and chairman of council of the Institute, I unveiled the agenda. The future is here. A key component of the agenda focuses on trade and finance collaboration. In view of the great potential in the African continental free trade area, and the need to build capacity for practitioners in the banking industry. The Institute will be executing a collaboration and MOU with Afrebrim Academy to run a joint capacity building and certification program in the areas of trade and finance. That MOU will be executed today. It's also instructive to know that the banking industry is setting up a $20 million human capital fund for the purpose of grooming and nurturing a pool of agile, innovative, market-ready workforce for the Nigerian banking industry. Furthermore, the Institute is embarking on a banking school project that will be constructed on the Institute 6 acre of land in Ogun State and will serve as a melting pot for the training and development of new and existing workforce in the industry. Distinguished audience, as I conclude, I want to commend the organizers of this program, particularly members of the Annual Lecture Implementation Pervasive Committee 
ably led by the Amazon, the group managing director of Fidelity Bank, Mrs. Neka Onyal Ibe, SCIP. I thank the team for the sacrifice of your time, the efforts and energy in putting the planning of this event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, I welcome you all to this special event. We definitely would have a very refreshing time. Please sit back, relax, and refresh yourself. Network, enjoy the rest of the proceeding. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you so very much. Can we still put our hands together for Mr. President? Thank you. Thank you. You know, I had the privilege of uh, reading through the resume of uh, the keynote speaker, the lecturer for today. And I must say to you that um, let's get our notepads ready. It's going to be a loaded session uh, this morning coming from Professor Benedict of Rama. You know, I need advice right now. I don't know who can advise me on an issue that's bothered, bothered me all morning. Um, my seven-year-old niece um, refused to go to school this morning. And I tried convincing her why she should go to school. And she says to me, my teacher is confused. And I said, how do you mean? He says, last week he came to me and said, four plus four is eight. The day after he says it's seven point plus one. Afterwards he says it's five plus three. He said, I'm not going to school until my teacher decides which one is the addition for eight. So, you know, this is our generation. Uh, let's put our hands together again for Mr. President. Uh, let me sing, let me just say a very big welcome to some of our past presidents. Again, I'm going to mention their name categorically. We have Mr. Femi Ekundayo, FCIB. A very big welcome, sir. Good, good to have you here. Uh, Professor Wale, okay, I hear he's, we're expecting him. We have Dr. Shego Aino, FCIB. Uh, welcome, sir. And my very good friend, Dr. Ucholo, thank you so very much. So good to have you here again. I've also been informed that we have the, the chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, uh, being represented by, uh, by the Deputy Zonal Command of the Lagos Command, Mr. Emeka Okoroji. I, got, I hope I got that right. Thank you so very much for uh, being a part of this event. Can we quickly invite Mr. Adetotu Suleiman, MFRO, Chairman, Board of Directors, Cadbury Nigeria Limited, uh, PLC rather, for a special remark on the occasion. Let's put the hands together for the Chairman of the occasion. Let's keep the clap coming until he steps on the podium. These are pace setters. These are captains of industries. Welcome, sir. It's good to have you this morning. Mr. President of the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria, uh, past presidents, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and most especially our guest lecturer uh, for today. Good morning. Uh, it's a delight uh, to be here um, to, to chair this uh, lecture. It didn't take too much convincing when I was told I, was, I would do this. Uh, I'm not really a banker, so when it's the Chartered of Bankers, but then I, I reflect that uh, most of my career as a consultant was actually consulted the banking industry, most of it. As a matter of fact, I was naive enough to think that I could run a bank. <laughs> I actually did have that aspiration that when I retire from being a consultant, I want to sit on the other side of the table. Then something happened in 2005. So the little the, the change happens, and then the complexity of the game changed totally. I just said, no, not for me. So I saved myself the trouble. And uh, you know, fast forward to today, I don't know whether I would like to be a banker. Because I reflect on what's been going on in banking. I'm asking myself, wow, it cannot be fun heading a bank. I mean, how can a bank that's been designed for 40 years, a, systemic, a systemically important bank, in the United States of America, the most sophisticated market, unravel in 48 hours. How? How does that happen? As, as if that wasn't bad enough, if less than a week later, 
what I thought was impossible happened. The collapse of the of credit Suisse. I mean, growing up, we assessed Swiss with stability. I mean, that was the epitome of financial stability. But the thing that struck me most of all, two things that struck me from what from the events. Number one is the speed with which it happened. And then secondly, it, sh it shook the whole notion of too big to fail. I, I mean, if a bank was going to fail, I never thought it would be a Swiss bank. I never thought it would be Credit Suisse. And then there is a question in my mind, can it happen here? Can it happen here? Are, are there banks that are too big to fail? I mean, it's going to happen when it happens like that, like it happened in the US. We, we don't know. Um, but uh, it's frightening. But the most significant thing, at least from, point, from a policy point of view, is the response of the monetary authorities in both countries and how they've managed in a fairly swift manner uh, to contain the contagion. Because there was, a, there was great fear that it was going to spread and we're going to see a repeat of 2008, 2009. That hasn't happened. I don't think we are completely out of the woods yet, but uh, we'll see how hard it happens. But I think there are one or two things we can learn as a country in terms of regulatory response to crisis. And I hope that the relevant authorities have taken note. Now, this morning's lecture is not really about banking, it's more about capital. And, um, and uh, if there's one thing that is holding us back as a continent, one thing, in my own view, is the is capacity of capital. We've, we've all heard about these statistics, you know, 1.2 billion people, 60% of arable land, and so on. We ask ourselves, I mean, the continent of the future, the youngest population, what's holding us back? In my view, one of the things that is holding us back is capital. We don't have the money we need you know, to, to embark on the development challenges and address the development challenges facing us as a continent. Two things, number one is that because of our historical, uh, you know, uh, where we're coming from history, we are poor people, relatively poor people in, 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 mother, in mother terms. And over since independence, I would say capital formation has also not gone as well as it could. So we haven't accumulated a lot of capital. I think we're rich, but we're very poor uh, relative to, say, the advanced uh, continents like Europe and America and all that. But more importantly also is the fact that Africa has not been as attractive to capital as you would have expected. Because my fundamental belief is that capital always goes to where there are opportunities. And here we have an opportunity in a continent that is brimming with opportunities where we need everything, where everything has yet to be done. How come the capital is not flocking in? How come capital is not flocking in? Part of the reason, of course, is the fact that the capital, even the, if you take all the capital in the world, it's finite. Put all the capital, all the surplus capital, you know, it's finite. And therefore, after nationals have taken care of their domestic requirements and they need to put their capital to work, they're looking for outlets. And it's a very competitive market out there. I don't think we have a continent provided a conducive enough or a severely attractive or severely competitive environment to attract capital. And for what I want, and the little capital we attract comes at great cost because of that what I call relative competitive disadvantage. So it's a challenge for, for us as a continent, uh, where to, what to do to mobilize internally as well as externally the capital that we require to surmount all the developmental challenges that confront us as a people, as a continent. I think that's where the lecture this morning is particularly apt. And uh, I just can't wait to um to listen to, to our guest lecturer. And the, and today to me is not only about the lecture or the subject, but also about the lecturer. 
I write his profile while I was waiting for this event to get started and I was kind of, let me say, I'm impressed, very, very impressed by all that you have done and all that you continue to do. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with the role you played in the formation of the African Free Trade uh, Area Agreement. Um, I'm very hopeful about the potential of that singular initiative. Impressed also with the, what you've done with respect to the payment system to promote intra Africa trade so that we don't have to depend on a third party currency. Many things that he's done. I think if there's, if he's anybody that's qualified to address the topic of today's lecture, is our guest lecturer. So, what I would have for you is just get out of the way so that we can take and listen to our guest lecturer for this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. All right, the hour we have all been waiting for. I like the quietness. Yes, when you say the hour we've all been waiting for and everywhere just goes quiet, that means it's, the sun is quite high from the lecturer this morning. Um, I like the fact that um, the chairman had begun interrogating the paper even before it is delivered. Um, something he said that is very key to me is the question he asked when he said, why is the continent not attracting the capital? I don't have answers for you there. Don't look at me like I have answers. No, I don't have the answers. Professor Benito Uruma Rama will do justice to those questions when it comes. Like I did say, it's the time we've been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, tie our seatbelts because something is indeed about to happen right now. As I call for the video of the man of the moment, Professor Benedict Orama. Let's take a listen as we invite The citation of Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, C-O-N-F-C-I-B. Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, CONFCIB, is the President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of African Export Import Bank, Afreksim Bank. He was born in Ahwada, Nigeria, on July 24, 1961, and attended Merchants of Light School, Oba, in Anambra State, Nigeria, where he earned a distinction in the West African School Certificate Examination in 1978. He graduated with honors in agricultural economics from the University of Ibadan in 1983. He obtained a Master of Science degree in agricultural economics in 1987 and a PhD in the same discipline in 1991 from the Obafemi Awolowo University, OAU, Ileife. Professor Orama was a United Company of Nigeria UACN scholar at the University of Ibadan and a postgraduate fellow at the Obafemi Awolowo University. He obtained an Advanced Management Certificate from Columbia Business School USA in 2015 and became a Professor of International Trade and Finance at Adeliki University, Nigeria in 2018. In December 2019, he received an honorary Doctor of Science degree in Agricultural Economics from the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, Nigeria. In March 2022, at the Azikiwe University, Oka. Before joining Afreksim Bank in 1994, Professor Orama worked at the Nigerian Export Import Bank, Nexim. Having risen through the ranks from Chief Analyst and Special Assistant to the first President of the Bank to a Senior Director and Executive Vice President, he was appointed to the position of President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of African Export-Import Bank, Afreksim Bank, a position he holds to date. As President of the Continental Exim Bank, he has demonstrated creativity, enterprise, 
and leadership. In less than a decade of stewardship, Professor Orama has transformed Afrexim Bank into a globally and continentally important institution. A recent Fitch Ratings report noted that Afrexim Bank has become a principal driver of economic transformation and a vital instrument for implementing the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFC-FTA. In less than seven years, he grew Afrexim Bank's assets and guarantees from about five billion U.S. dollars in September 2015 to more than 30 billion U.S. dollars in 2022, and grew annual revenues from 400 million U.S. dollars in 2015 to about 1.5 billion U.S. dollars in 2022. Creating a sizable pan-African institution has rendered Afrexim Bank pivotal to managing global shocks in Africa. For instance, in 2016-2017, when the commodity crisis broke, Afrexim Bank disbursed over 10 billion US dollars into Africa and 2.2 billion US dollars into Nigeria pandemic and the ensuing Ukraine crisis. The bank's investment of 2 billion US dollars into Africa's vaccination program enabled Nigeria and others to secure access to the COVID-19 vaccines, saving numerous lives and livelihoods. Buoyed by a belief in the strategic importance of an Africa-controlled financial system, Professor Orama has led the creation of innovative instruments to support the development of a strong and interconnected continental financial system. Under his leadership, the bank worked with the African Union and the AFC-FTA Secretariat to develop the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, to enable intra-African trade and payments in African currencies, paving the way for achieving annual savings of about 5 billion US dollars in payment charges by Africa. Professor Orama is also leading the bank's efforts to promote intra-African trade through the creation of several novel programs. Under his leadership, Afrexim Bank has created a biennial intra-African trade fair, a premier marketplace for promoting cross-border trade and investments. In collaboration with the African Union and the AFC FTA Secretariat, the bank under the able leadership of Professor Orama has also created the AFC FTA Adjustment Fund that will compensate countries for revenue losses that will occur due to the AFC FTA associated tariff removals and help them adjust smoothly to the implementation of the AFC FTA and the Afrexim Bank Africa Collaborative Transit Guarantee Scheme. He also created an impact fund and an insurance subsidiary called the Fund for Export Development in Africa, FEDA, and Afrexinsure respectively. In Nigeria, the presence and impact of Afrexim Bank has been significant. Under his leadership, Afrexim Bank has contributed immensely to strengthening the Nigerian financial sector and supported the growth of the private sector. The bank, under his leadership, is currently developing a 300 million US dollar ultra modern African Medical Center of Excellence, AMCE, in Abuja which will help transform the country's health and medical services industry, improve healthcare delivery, as well as make Nigeria a regional hub for medical tourism. The bank is also developing an Afrexim Bank Africa Trade Center, AATC, in Abuja, which will, among others, house the bank's regional office, a modern conference and an exhibition facility, a tech incubation center, a hotel, and offices for international and pan-African organizations. Further, the bank has completed the development 
of an Africa Quality Assurance Center in Ugu State. This facility is expected to significantly boost the testing and certification of Nigerian goods for exports and domestic consumption. As a prolific writer, Professor Orama has several publications to his credit. He has authored books, contributed chapters to several books on economic development, trade, and trade finance, and written several journal articles. The most recent writings are the books on Foundations of Structured Trade Finance, a chapter on export credit administration in capital-scarce developing countries, Handbook of Global Trade Policy, as well as policy papers on training to green growth in fossil export-dependent economies, a pathway for Africa in the global policy, Wiley, and a Frexim Bank in the era of the AFC-FTA in the Journal of African Trade. Aside from being the chairman of the board of directors of Afrexim Bank, Professor Orama serves on the board of several other organizations. He is the chairman of the board of directors of the Fund for Export Development in Africa, FEDA, the chairman of the management board of directors of the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, the current chairman of the executive committee of the Arab Africa Trade Bridges AATB, the chairman of the board of trustees of the African Union COVID-19 Response Fund. He is also a member of the Intra-African Trade Fair IATF Advisory Council, a member of the Practitioners Advisory Board of the Institute for Trade and Innovation IFTI at Offenberg University, Germany and a member of the Emerging Markets Advisory Council of the Institute of International Finance. For his contributions to international trade and investments, he received national honors from the governments of Cameroon and Russia in 2019. In 2022, he was decorated with several awards, including the Leadership Person of the Leadership Magazine. Outstanding Visionary Financial Leader of the Year Award 2022 by GE7 Initiative and the George Washington University Institute of African Studies African Energy Person of the Year in 2022 by the Africa Energy Chamber. African Banker of the Year Award 2017 and 2022 African Champion of the Year by the Africa CEO Forum 2022 African Bar Association Medal of Merit Leadership Award of Honor of Commander of the Order of the Niger CON by the Government of the Republic of Nigeria Okay, I'm happy my three daughters, Mr. President, Chairman of Council, distinguished guests, it is my singular honor and privilege to present to you this visionary and transformational leader, a consummate professional, a Midas touch, an astute manager of men and resources, highly distinguished and an accomplished role model, Professor Benedict Okechuku Orama, COFIB, to deliver the 2023 Annual Lecture of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. For you. Can we keep our hands together still for Professor Benedict Orama? Thank you so very much, sir. I'm going to seize the opportunity of a handshake before the lecture. Thank you for the cameras. Thank you very much. Okay. 
don't think there's any like just no. Thank you very much, Master of Ceremony. Let me start by recognizing the chairman of this morning's event, Mr. Silliman Adetotu, the president of the Shadi of Bankers of Nigeria, the past vice president who are here, and all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who are here and who have been recognized when the master of ceremony established the initial protocol. I must say that the chairman of the location has done part of the job, just as the president of the Chinese Institute of Bankers who spoke earlier did. But I have been asked to speak, so I will complete what they started. I'm most grateful to my dear brother and friend, Dr. Ken Opara, for the nice words, and also to the chairperson who has spoken so eloquently about the subject matter of today's discussion. I'm most highly honored by the opportunity to deliver this year's annual Chattered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria lecture on a topic that has huge implications for Africa. And part of me where I talk about Africa, because my job is about Africa, so I speak a lot about Africa. I thank the leadership of CIBN for going to great lengths to accommodate my rather complex schedule. I know that this lecture was rescheduled once. I apologize for that, but thank them for the honor of being able eventually to deliver it. The Chilean Institute of Bankers of Nigeria has an invaluable record of leading the debate on issues that matter to Nigeria and indeed Africa. I'm proud to be a fellow of the Institute. Uh, thank Chairman Uche for making that possible, and all the governing council who also made it possible. I take this event as an opportunity to enrich the contributions of the CIBN towards strengthening Africa's and Nigeria's financial system. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the kernel of the argument that we're making today is aptly captured in a statement made recently by the President of Ghana, His Excellency President Akufado, and I quote, we in Africa have manpower. We should have the political will it is time to make Africa work. If we stop being beggars and spend African money inside the continent, Africa will not need to ask for respect from anyone. We will get the respect we deserve if we make it, that if we make Africa 
prosperous as you should be. Respect we follow. Central to that seemingly ordinary but deep admonition is that we should quit our beggarly attitudes and strive to spend Africa's money inside Africa if we hope to achieve prosperity and earn the respect we all deserve. That is throws up two critical questions that set the stage for my presentation today. First, why are Africans still hooked on grants? I'm begging all the time, despite over 60 years of independence. Second, why is African money spent outside of and by whom? Africa's development experience has proven beyond any doubt that grants cannot finance prosperity, that we cannot spend what we do not control, and that ownership of resources does not necessarily translate to their control. In other words, an owner of a resource may actually beg the controller of that resource to grant him or her access to that resource. I call this humiliating situation that Africa finds itself in the poverty in wealth paradox. It is no wonder that although Africa has foreign exchange reserves amounting to about $500 billion, about half of Africa's external debt today, stashed away in foreign banks, the same African countries, owners of these funds, cannot easily borrow them from the same foreign banks that hold the resources, sometimes on the excuse of country risk or compliance complications, issues that are never mentioned when the funds are being deposited in the first place. It is in the context of the foregoing that the topic of today's lecture Unlocking the constraints to Africa's economic transformation, insights into the power of capital is apt and opportune. Without a doubt, capital represents the foundation on which a viable economic transformation can be built. I think our chairman emphasized this when he spoke. I will quickly add that while ownership of capital is necessary, it is its control that provides the sufficient condition for capital to become an effective factor of production that can deliver development. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was the economist, Robert It was set out, and perhaps So that's the clear strategy, industrial revolution.
que that struggle continued in Europe, leading to the emergence of socialism, fueled by the work of fueled by the work of Karl Marx in 1867, titled The Capital. In that consequential work, Marx argues that I that explains the strategy adopted by the colonial master at the onset of colonialism. Effective that it is perhaps at the root of the development challenge of Africa. Even today, more than six decades, aptly outlined that strategy. And I'll quote him economically, a colonial possession means to the home country. Simply a privileged market. Dumping is almost not. Sport and any contact with the rest of the world, and any contact with the rest of the world, the colony is forbidden to establish any industry. payment and services and so on. They can also attract capital through borrowings and other fund mobilization activities. Empirical evidence has shown that foreign owned by 
not able to perform these roles if in developing countries. That answers a bit some of the questions that the chief asked earlier. Why are we not attracting even the capital that is out there, the institutions that are supposed to do that are not the right institutions. I mean, but the business all of the foreign banks in any economy companies, and that's on the When the foreign bank establishes the first people they support that business, the businesses from where they came from. Mobilizing savings, not that for them. It is done to make money out of for the simple reason that everyone will be wary of new names, let alone an exotic one. And major credit. Is determined by those who control the capital required to be the market. It is therefore important system that welcomes foreign banks, but which deliberate policy must have the strong participation of Africa owned banks. I make this proposal further supported by leading economists' arguments, such as Joseph Stiglitz, who have variously argued that over-dependence on foreign capital is a burden of most developing countries. Many argued that foreign capital increases the risk of economic volatility and they reverse the incidences of imported and vulnerability to global shocks. Also, reliance on foreign capital reduces government economy over fiscal policy, reduces the scope for the growth of the domestic banking system, weakens the competitiveness of manufacturers, and shrinks capacity of locally owned contractors who do not benefit from foreign capital support to build for and execute national and regional projects. The experience of Asian economies presents valuable lessons on this subject. The economist Edwin Rubens, in his work on Japan's economic emergence, wrote, and I quote, despite the difficult oriental con conditions that forced Japan, that faced Japan, she succeeded in, in, in carrying out a continuous cumulative development. This process was only partly a planned government-sponsored effort. Japan did not rely upon foreign to take all, all the steps and foot on quote. It is now known that the key to the transformation of successful Asian economies was control of their own domestic financial system. In China, foreign banks accounted for only 1.3%. In India, it was 6.2%. Similarly, in the Republic of Korea, 
the share was 5%, 13% in Russia, 15% in Brazil. These are comes in short that these economies were able to use domestic policies to direct capital into national priority sectors and activities. So, Acted as superstructures that massively supported economically impactful projects. Greater China Development Bank, also China Exim Bank in 1994. China Export Credit and Insurance Corporation, China Show in 20, 2001, as events to prepare the country's transformation. The Korean economic miracle since the early 1970s was partly a result of financial sector reforms and also the refocusing and reorientation of national trade and development finance institutions including the Korea Development Bank in 19, that was created in 1954, Industrial Development Bank that was created in 1961, the Korea Exim Bank 1976, and later the Korea Trade Insurance Corporation in 1992. The total assets of the two Chinese development banks represented 23% of the 2020 GDP of China, estimated at $14.7 trillion. The development bank's assets, asset share of GDP was 19% for South Korea and 9% for Brazil. The experience of African countries has been different from those of the Asian Since the era of, <clears throat> of the colonial rule, foreign capital has been a dominating force in Africa, increasing in intensity after the introduction of the IMF-sponsored structural adjustment program that led to the liberalization of the financial sector of most African economies between 1980s and early 2000s. With that liberalization, national development financial institutions were largely shut down while inflation wiped out the capital of domestic banks, paving the way for foreign banks to fill the void. As a result, the share of banking industry assets held by foreign banks rose from 34% in 1995 to about 66% in 2008 and 73% in 2010. However, since the early 2010s, a combination of factors began to shrink the share of foreign banks on the continent. But this experience varied from country to country. In some countries, foreign, uh, the share of uh, banking assets held by foreign banks still exceeded 80%. It's only a few countries such as Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, South Africa, that the share is 20% or less. So what becomes obvious to you from this is that Americans control American banks. Europeans control European banks. Chinese control Chinese banks. Indians control Indian banks. Brazilians control Brazilian banks. But only in Africa that others control African banks. Despite recent gains, Africa's financial system remains small, fragmented, and weak relative to other regions. African multilateral financial institutions are also among the least capitalized among peers in the global financial system. 
the five regional continental financial institutions hold combined capital of $17 billion, which is only 0.7% of Africa's 2020 GDP. Compare it to what um, I reported earlier for China, Korea, and Brazil. Their combined total assets amounted to about $85 billion in 2020, which was only 3.5% of Africa's GDP in that same year. In relative terms, that's the share, the, the share, if you, if you want to calculate the percent of um, the African development, multilateral development banks in terms of relative share, of the assets also held by banks in China and Korea, you will see that they are just very, very marginal. There is no way that a continent that wants to develop itself, which requires capital, as that weak link can be financed or can get out of poverty with this scenario. The consequences of the fragilities of Africa's financial system is the increased level of reliance on foreign capital for all aspects of economic activities. As a result, Africa has become very vulnerable to the global shocks. Economic volatility has increased significantly and the power of governments to deploy policies to drive infrastructure and industrial development has been severely eroded. As a result, many African economies remain commodity dependent with the rich resource endowments serving the purpose of others rather than Africans. It is to begin to reverse this sorry situation that African multilateral financial institutions were created to mobilize capital both within and outside Africa and to deploy them mainly to serve Africa's purpose and interests. In other words, they are to serve as a platform for ownership and control of capital that Africa needs to develop. That is central in the purpose of the multilateral financial institutions that have been created. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, African Bank's own experience demonstrates what is possible if we diligently implement that strategy and if we strengthen our financial institutions and use them as agents to unleash economic transformation through the power of capital. Permit me to cite a few examples. From 2015 to 2017, the commodity super cycle ended. And many commodity dependent countries went into difficulties. International banks cut credit lines to Africa and many African economies faced the possibility of defaulting on their trade debt payment obligations. A present bank stepped in and launched a special program called the Countercyclical Trade Liquidity Facility, through which it disbursed over $10 billion to many African central and commercial banks, helping to avert potentially catastrophic default situation at that time. Nigeria received about $3.5 billion of those funds. In 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, international banks once again cut credit lines to Africa at a time unprecedented credit lines were required to procure personal protective equipment test kits, therapeutics, food and fertilizers, and to pay a backlog of trade debt payments obligations that were falling due. 
and Frozen Bank once again contributed significantly to filling the gap, disbursing an aggregate amount of eight billion dollars during the under the under. And when the COVID-19 vaccines became available, it became a game of numbers and the size of your wallet. It was also everyone for himself or herself. So financing and no financing was available to vaccines. Again, there was an African bank. The African Union's African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team was able to negotiate 400 million doses of Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, which a present bank underwrote at a level of $2 billion, making, making it the first time ever Africa achieved the good procurement of an emergency product underwritten by an African bank. And I must say a few words about this. It wasn't only that there was, that capital was not available. In fact, in many countries, their banks were advised not to finance anybody who wanted to borrow money to buy vaccines. So it wasn't even about availability, it was about nationalism. And the reason for that was that vaccines were scarce. So countries use whatever mechanisms they had to ensure they had access and they prevented the others from having access until they had their own. If we needed uh, any wake up call as to make ourselves stronger, that was the wake up call. And in a few months, the Dangote refinery and petrochemical plant will become operational, becoming the largest single, uh, the largest single train refinery in the world, and one of the largest nitrogen fertilizer and petrochemical plants in the world. That more than fourteen billion dollar project has advanced in the most difficult time because our Frozen Bank and Nigerian banks backed it. The development of a $2.9 billion hydroelectric dam project has commenced in Tanzania. Thanks to the financing arranged by our Frozen Bank and supported by a number of African commercial banks. The Rufuji Dam, being developed solely by African contractors from Egypt, will generate more than 2,000 megawatts of electricity and create a reservoir with an area of more than 914 square kilometers to help irrigate the land make Tanzania self-sufficient in power by 2025, help control flooding. That project represents the largest in trafficking EPC project ever developed in Africa by Africans. Without African capital, this would not happen possible. Although Cote d'Ivoire had always aimed at becoming a leading center for the primary processing of cocoa beans into cocoa butter, cocoa powder, cocoa cake, and so on. It was a Frexin bank that supported the creation of about 120,000 metric tons of additional processing capacity that enabled Cote d'Ivoire to overtake the Netherlands as the center for primary possession of cocoa beans. Although this dream had been there for years, if we didn't have an African bank, it would have remained a dream today. Today, 
most international banks have withdrawn from financing oil and gas for obvious reasons. Threatening the economic foundation of many African economies, including Nigeria, who are dependent on hydrocarbons. It is thanks to our present bank that critical financing still flows to this sector. Funding for the import and export of oil in the past three years exceeded $15 billion in aggregate. Over $4 billion have been disbursed to Nigeria in 2022 alone. And although the African Continental Free Trade Agreement has come into force, implementing it to ensure we attain the realization of its full potential requires funding from African sources. Again, our present bank is making significant contributions in that direction. Funding the Secretariat of the uh, AFCFTA, supporting the negotiation of critical protocols, and working with the AFCFTA Secretariat to develop implementation instruments. The Pan African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, and Africa payment infrastructure has been introduced and supports payments for trade in African currencies. It is our present bank's clearing and settlement funding amounting to $3 billion that underpins its operations. The FCFT Adjustment Fund, intended to support participating states and companies to adjust in an orderly manner to the new trading regime has been established. The African Union has appointed a Fresen Bank as the manager of the $10 billion fund. A Fresen Bank has also committed $1 billion to make sure that the fund got started. The important question to ask is whether any of these would have been possible without the role an African institution Okay. Without the role as an African institution, in this case, a president bank played. Why we should welcome foreign owned banks? They are, they are welcome. The space must not be completely ceded to them if we hope to drive our development in our desired direction. And it is important to point out that our first bank has been able to make these modest contributions because it is largely African in ownership and control. And African governments have been steadfast in meeting its capitalization needs, making it possible for management to deliver on the collective vision. How do we ensure Sure, greater African control of our banking system. You may then ask, how do we make Africa-owned financial institutions capable and effective? Permit me, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to first outline our president's contribution towards that end before making broad suggestions. Our view at our Flexing Bank that the current voluntary exit of many international banks from Africa should not be of concern to us and should, in fact, be seen positively. A president bank has developed a strategy to ensure that capable African investors acquire the local subsidiaries of these international banks that are being sold. We have so far supported acquisitions amounting to $800 million, and we are well advanced in doubling that under our intra-African investment financing 
facility. Ensuring that capable African entities prefer operating banks acquire these subsidiaries will lay the foundation for African banks to effectively play their worth creating roles on our continent. Our first bank has also expanded and intensified its lines of credit and trade services offerings designed to support local banks to properly serve their clientele. We have made sure that, uh, that that becomes universal, targeting about 500 of the 600 regulated African banks. Our aim is to grant trade services lines of up to $8 billion under the African Bank Trade Facilitation Facility. We are also intensifying efforts towards mobilizing African foreign exchange reserves and using them to support Africa better. We created the African Resource Mobilization Unit, which implements a central bank deposit program and other deposit mobilization activities from African sources. An aggregate amount of about $33 billion have been mobilized since 2017 when we established, when we started this effort. It is still a paltry amount considering the almost $500 billion Africa holds in the foreign exchange reserve. But we think it's a good beginning. We have also deliberately used this instrument to better diversify our sources of liability so that we are not 100% dependent on, on outside markets. Today, from almost 100%, we now have African sources contributing about 33% of our liabilities. Repo markets exist in Europe, the US, and many other markets to support trading, to support the trading of their bonds, including Euro bonds. Africa had historically lacked that infrastructure. The consequence that Euro bonds issued by African entities are priced below what their peers attract. For the banking system we deserve. Beyond all of these, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
more needs to be done at all levels to realize the ambitions of a well-functioning African financial system the strong participation of African controlled and African owned banks. At the continental level, the AFCFT protocol on services should at some point consider the possibility of banking, of um, portability of banking licenses so that banks can operate across borders seamlessly. Banking regulations should also be harmonized. The goal should be to make every African bank a domestic bank anywhere they wish to operate. That way they can be stronger and compete better against foreign owned banks. There's also the need to accelerate the creation of the African Central Bank which will champion the continent-wide institutional reforms that will support an integrated banking and financial system. The African Central Bank project still faces hurdles. The draft protocol for the establishment of the Central Bank has yet to be submitted to the African Union Assembly as this Selected headquarters of the Central Bank, Nigeria should support the African Union Champion for Financial Institutions, His Excellency President Nana Akufado of Ghana, in accelerating this project. African governments and central banks should also make deliberate efforts to strengthen their banking systems. Nigeria's experience in that direction can serve as a guide. The implementation of local content policies must be such as to support the use of local banks in implementing big projects within Africa. In addition, governments should consider creating national development finance institutions on the governance arrangement that minimizes government and political interference. It is important that those that are operating, in this case in Nigeria, Nexim, Bank of Industry, uh, the Development Bank of Nigeria, that are, they are strongly and properly capitalized so that they can play their role as their peers are doing in Asia and other parts of the world. It's not enough to just create the institutions but we must equip them if we want to make sure we use them to finance our development. Support for African regional financial institutions is also crucial. And that should be in the form of increasing their capital and also strengthening their management where necessary. Also governments must become, must promote strong local content regulations I mentioned, and the rest of Nigeria uh, is something I think all of us should be done so that they can return This will require a decision and other financial institutions. The benefits will be much, much more than the cost. Africa owned banks who can enroll also have an important role to play in, in the form of strength capital and post their commercial goals while the objectives of their I think commercial banks where they make money they must also understand that their agents are 
of development. African banks should collaborate more of share information and knowledge and be strong and engage in fair competition whenever they find wherever they find themselves. And when African banks operate across their borders within Africa, they must make sure they avoid the paradox I mentioned. They must make sure they go in with local partners so that they can serve the purpose of the countries where they are located more effectively. As I conclude, please permit me to again thank the leadership of the Chita Institute of Bankers for the opportunity of delivering this lecture. Let me ask those who organized the event today and express my also appreciation to the chairman for coming. And all of you who spared the very busy schedules to be here. The main message I want to convey today is that capital is critical for the development agenda we are pursuing. Where we have abundant supply of labor, the only thing we don't have is capital. But we have the wealth. The problem with us is more of the control of what we have. Right? ownership of that, if it had others who control them. We must change that now. We must use it to accumulate more capital so that we become competitive in the world. I think the message is Africa first. Thank you very much. Let's keep the applause. Let's keep the applause. Let's keep the applause. Thank you so very much, Professor Benedict Orama. Wonderful, insightful, educating uh, lecture, I must say. Thank you so very much. Thank you. We can now we can all now sit. Thank you. We will be interrogating the lecture, no doubt. I'm sure um, we have a few questions uh, to ask. Uh, the lecturer this, this beautiful day. Uh, but for me, uh, my takeaway was exactly on how he began the conversation uh, on the background to which he began the conversation. He did say, Africans should quit beggarly attitudes. He also did say, spend Africa money in Africa. That speaks to quite a number of us here. And he also did say grants and finance prosperity. I think he deserves a round of applause. Thank you so very much, Professor Benedict, for being in person today. I'm excited seeing you today. Just, just uh, you won't believe where you will get to after the show. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, I acknowledge the president. Thank you so very much. I, I would do this as quickly as I can. I mean, Please, if I don't mention your name, hold me responsible for the IBM. Uh, Mr. Oscar Onyema has left. I saw him earlier earlier today. Oscar Onyema Group, NGX. Um, we have representatives of the above of Lagos here. We call them um, uh, our royal fathers. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you so very much for coming. Dr. Shei, I would be from our extra. I saw him somewhere outside a while ago. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Tindelemo, thank you so very much. I, I thought you had retired uh, after you left the Central Bank until I realized that you are still the chairman of Titan Trust Bank. Sir, he needs to rest some more. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. 
Professor Enase Okenedo, Clemens G Bank MDs that we have here. We have the MD of Ecobank and Mr. Bolaji Lawa, FCIB. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And Mr. Natha Ude, uh, MD, uh, Nova Merchant Bank. Thank you. Mr. Olufemi Bakare, FCIB MD, uh, Parallax Bank. Uh, Mr. Ubaka Suleiman, FCIB MD, Sterling Bank. I, oh, he's also left. He, he went to the bathroom. I'll be back in, in a bit. Um, Mr. Bankole Smith, FCIB, MDFC, FMB Bank. Uh, Mr. Demola, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Mr. Jenny Dalu. Dalu, yes, I met Dalu a while ago when he was coming in. Dalu is the MD CEO of um, Rand, Rand Merchant Bank. Thank you, Dalu. Dalu, can I just do this? Thank you. You know, I like that name, Dalu. Uh, a lot of you don't know how it's pronounced. Dalu means thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't know how is this coin, but it could be Shuku Dalu, which means thank you, Lord. Which could mean God, thank you. Uh, am I doing very well? So at this point in time, I'm call a few other names uh, before the... Um, Uh, runs to a close, but then um, we we know we know that there will be questions. We know you have another question. Uh, for want of time, you can lost this morning, and uh, in numbers to just three. Um, let me invite my father, uh, my adopted father, Doctor uh, Tundelemo. I'm sure he has a question for Professor Benito Roma. Can we take the mic to Doctor Tundelemo? Yes, the mic is by you, sir. Mm -hmm. And of the occasion, Mr. Dr. Sulak, Professor Rama, the most I'd like to thank you for the lecture. Very, very uh, detailed. And indeed, all of us have taken copious notes and I, that were really impressed with the depth of the lecture. Um, for me, the insight you have given today uh, is very, very profound, particularly the and I want to test it, you know, those things that you listed out. And indeed, uh, we're very proud uh, that Apprexit made it happen for us uh, to be part of the acquisition that we made, the details of which are in the uh, public domain. I will also say that for all of the things you have mentioned, something is very, very critical in attracting capital, and that's good governance. Because if you must attract capital globally, country risk is very important. I mean, there are bankers here, many of us have run our institutions to a point that they are triple A. But when you get international rating agencies, they say they will not give you international rating that is superior to the country rating. So all of us must continue to carry out the advocacy that our fortune is tied so the, our country's fortune, so that we can be part of that change that we all need. And then, of course, the importance of capital also extends to the fact that we have embedded in Africa capital that cannot be used. Uh, I think it was the Peruvian economist, Fernando de Soto, that wrote the book, Ministry of Capital, where he said that if we will look back, and this goes to many of us here, bankers, and ensure that we decouple this and we secretize most of the Things we have it's easier for us to access capital. Foreign institutions identify eligible projects, unlike. Afrazim has done, like ADB, AFC have also done, we can then identify these, put down our capital, but then lead, you know, the consortium of other foreign banks in, in attracting their attention to the potentials that are in Africa. They are over there, they can't see the details of it. So if above our capital treasure, 
But then we can lead out in ensuring that. Once again, thank you very much. Capital yeah. to Africa, and yeah. I believe that, that was, uh, it was an intervention. You are not uh, okay. now say, okay, can I do? Uh, for a question, if she's still here, Professor, please get the mic across to Prof. Thank you. Thank if you, you oblige me, Prof, let's make it as brief as possible. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much. Just to join in commending our lecturer this morning for a most enlightening lecture in which you have emphasized the power of our to unleash Africa's economic transformation. I noticed that when you were making your speech, you did end with um, specific policy suggestions, but recognizing that across Africa, the needs are varied. I wonder whether you could speak a bit as to what can be prioritized on the macro level, tested interventions, which cuts across, of course, the financial resources, but also we have the policy reforms that are essential to deepening and strengthening the financial system and then human capital on a macro level for the desired transformation to unleash capital, what should be prioritized? Thank you. Thank you so very much, Prof. Thank you so very much. And finally, let me invite Mr. Femi Ekundayo, FCIB, for his question or intervention. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. President, and this is good participants with particular reference to our special guest speaker. My name is Femi Akudayo, the past president of CIPA. And I'd like to place on record my sincere appreciation of uh, the guest speaker, particularly when we see Nigerians making Nigeria proud across the globe. We are very proud of you. Thank you very much. Prof, mine are just two basic questions. The, the first is the efforts being made by Africa are quite um, appreciated. But to what extent do you think that the dominance of Paris in the financial system of Francophone countries would impact the early accomplishment of your goal? Uh, because we know we run into some problem in this area. My second question is, what could be the impact of Inter and intra this is of the past in the eighties and nineties. By back or to do good things. I'm going to challenge now with uh, the ex we can be energized inter and inter collaboration among banks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Start some question to respond to. You can do it here. Fantastic. Please open that to get up across. And so, although for the domestic bank that are small, fragile, try to rise, the 
the importance of having a strike, just the business where uncertainties are reduced, where the uh, macroeconomic policies and the outcomes are predictable to the operators, and where those who deal with those institutions can also predict them, uh, because that is what we determine whether make an investment or they do not make investments. That will determine how they assess the risks of what they are doing. So the, the most critical thing is um, the, uh, the fiscal and monetary policies uh, that governments um, implement. And not only uh, is it uh, necessary that they become they achieve stability, they help us achieve stability and predictability. But I also use the word several times in my speech, deliberate policy, deliberate. Uh, there are uh, deliberate policies the government can make to make sure certain activities uh, become successful. Uh, especially when you really consider that they are starting from a very weak point. Um, many, in many African countries, foreign banks, um, and they do not have even the, the right manpower to be able to and compete with the foreign banks. So those we are being to make sure that the sector rises. And this would normally be temporary interventions until uh, you, you achieve the results that's it. So essentially, uh, is a necessary condition. As um, you you see what happens when you have inflation. When the capital banks are wiped out, the, the banks are struggling to uh, to build back the capital, uh, and they are not able. To to uh, to shoot because they are not they do not have the capacity um a macroeconomic that uh, is not that inflationary um, you. And do so, of course. Um, the other things, making uh, uh, sure also uh, uh, that even certain regulations that are adopted in such a way that the regulator recognizes the initial conditions in country. That is development driven. And so that is where to put it. Uh, and being development driven means it has an and, and agency of place within that framework. Um, the second question uh, from my brother is uh, uh, what happened, how to deal with the Francophone countries? Well, this in Francophone countries um, is not the way it used to be. Um, 
you see how the CFA Frank he hasn't gone away. Uh, but if you look at the financial system in some of those countries, you will see that increasingly you are seeing the emergence of um, uh, of local local I mean indigenously owned uh, if I think, uh, that those institutions are now taking over the assets of the big French banks that used to be there. I know we financed the acquisition of uh, BMP assets, um, or, or finalizing the financing of the acquisition of society general assets. Uh, and in fact, is um, uh, evidence of change that is occurring that even the, that the, the CEOs of those banks uh, are consulting with us to. Long as you can imagine, uh, more than 100 years of uh, history. Uh, it can't just be one. But good thing is that we begin to change. And the end point of the shit on that is. There's a protocol on trade services. The protocol on trade services also to be up with most issues of trade services at negotiator. We are pending there. I mentioned something speech. This, uh, one of the things that we think should happen is the issue of making it easy for, making it easy for banks to operate wherever they want to operate in Africa. Uh, so if you have a license in one country, it becomes the same license anywhere you go. Um, issue of taxation of, for certain kinds of services that are provided by financial institutions. Uh, and there are many other things you, you, the financial institutions know better. I think we, we, we uh, um, asking for people to come for uh, um, seminars and conferences where we, where we gathering um, some of these views. I think there was, a, there was a conference that was held in Tanzania recently. Uh, but I think through the strategy, through the strategy of the bankers. We will try to more directly involve maybe the Nigerian banks, so we can also add some some of your views on what should be negotiated. But we think that the AFCFT provides a good framework for changes that will be beneficial to the African banking system entirely to happen. Thank you. As well, she's here representing the Honorable Minister of, uh, of Aviation. Uh, thank you so very much for coming. Thank you for joining us this beautiful day. I did call Mrs. Bukola Mr. I apologize. Mrs. Bukola Smith uh, is the MD, CEO, FSDH. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. More time. Yes, we also have um, Elias Igbina uh, Kenzua had on me. That just came in in a few seconds. Yes, she's the MDCO of um, uh, Global Bank. Thank you so very much, sir. I'll come for tutorials if I didn't get the name correctly. 
Uh, thank you so very much. Yes, we also have the representative of the Minister for uh, Ministry of Commerce, Lagos States and Industry. She's ably represented by Mrs. Uh, uh, Adeshin Ellen uh, Titilayo, Director of Commerce from the Ministry of Commerce. Thank you so very much for coming again. So at this point in time, I uh, will run as fast as we can. Time is no longer our friend. Um, let me invite, if you were here, uh, Ogu, F FCIB, MD, CEO, Zenith Bank, for a goodwill message. Let's put our hands together. Let's put those hands together. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please permit me to stand on the already established protocol. Uh, first and foremost is to thank our guest lecturer, Professor Okeorama, for that not only totally insightful uh, lecture, but more like a mess of renaissance. And need to wake up. Nobody knows Africa other than Africans. Nobody will take risk in Africa other than Africans. Nobody will know the corners, like we say it in Wari Palace, the corals, other than we Africans. I think he has brought before us a huge challenge. In a way, he took a swipe on the banking industry as a major anchor for accumulation and circulation of capital. But I think the banking industry will not be doing this on, a, on its own. We need the cooperation of all the stakeholders to achieve this. And let me also say that the banking industry is actually trying. And there have been a lot of initiatives under the same bank where we have different intervention program, which is uh, being done to provide long-term concessionary funding uh, sources for entrepreneurs. But if you look deeper and you want to begin to descend in terms of who are those enjoying this capital? You find out that not much of indigenous African businesses or let me say indigenous Nigerian businesses are enjoying it. Therefore, we need a wake up call too on indigenous African and Nigerian entrepreneurs. We need to come forward. And even talking about coming forward, on the, if you analyze the lecture, Prof is also talking about building strong and stable institutions strong and stable institution that will endure. Because if you take a look at Morgan Stanley Index, there is no African country that is on the developed market index. When you look at the developing market index, you have Egypt and South Africa. And on the frontier market, you have only about six countries. Nigeria is there, out of 54 countries in Africa. So it goes to show that Africa is in their need of capital. And, and let me also say that if you take a look at the G, uh, GDP in Africa, effectively, Africa's GDP is about 2.8 trillion. Relative to the total world GDP, is about less than 3%. If you extend it further uh, globally, Africa's share of IPO, which is also a source of uh, capital raise, is less than 3%. That goes to show that Africa needs to build stronger institution that has the capacity to be able to attract capital. Prof also talked about the fact that there is no free lunch. Therefore, we will be ready to pay the price of having to build and accumulate capital and of getting the capital to work. It is one thing for us to make capital valuable, it's another for us to ensure that the capital is actually working and earning the desired dividend. Despite so doing, we lose it. And if you compare our population to the world, president of uh, the institute also made reference to the fact that in terms of landmass, Africa accounts for about 20%. So it's a question of having the space, having the weight, and without anything to show for it. So every one of us here has a responsibility to begin to incubate and build and develop the Africa champion of tomorrow. So that once the capital is there, and those who are determined to build bigger and stronger institutions are there, 
we'll see that together, Africa will also begin to accelerate and make progress. Again, we also have institution, I'm sure my friend, Abba is the CEO of NESM, providing long-term funding. But I think I'm listening to Prof. Abba, you need to look at your model again. So we need to begin to consider issues of risk sharing instead of risk transfer. So by so doing, when we have risk sharing uh, arrangement, it means everybody's skin is in the game. And collectively, when we bear a risk together, you see that we'll be able to hold ourselves and we'll create stability even when the wind is contrary. So I want to thank Prof and also thank the Institute for organizing this lecture and come on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Institute. You could not have chosen a better person other than our Prof. And let me also testify to the fact that in the year of the COVID, we were talking to some where we have already signed contract for them to give us some placement. These placements were just for one year. What year of the COVID? They want me to pray. Do you have any funding arrangement? And he said to me, because of COVID, we are going to develop a program that will provide long-term funding. Indeed, the, a trick is one of the beneficiaries of that program. So that became, it constituted a bragging rights. Today, when I'm talking to the foreign banks, I take my time to look at the offer. If you, don't, if you are not giving me two years, I'll tell you, keep it there, because I know where I need to go to when I need a long-term funding. So the place to go to for me remains Afrezim Bank. So I must thank you for your Pan-African disposition. You are not just saying it, but you are living it. And where all of us are prepared to queue behind you as you execute this very laudable African agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Ebenezer of, of Bank and CEO, he speaks for banks. He, he sold his own market to share. Let me uh, speak. Um, I'll run away from pronouncing the name. You do me the honors when you come. Let's have a pronunciation of the name. So I don't mind trade office. Please come. Thank you. So can we pronounce together for him? Thank you. Thank you. Please can we still can we continue with the clap? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a ex I mean, it's been a pleasure and privilege to be um, invited and come here to speak to such a prominent group of financial and banking specialists. So first of all, I will not uh, constrain myself for the protocol procedure, although I'm a trained diplomat from Taiwan, but let me just skip the all those kind of uh, protocol and come straight to the goodwill message and what I need to say today. Um, I have asked my colleagues that come from my office to put a three minutes constraining order so that I will finish everything in, within three minutes. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, President uh, Kenopara of NCIB, and also a listening to such a distinguished professor of Africa Airport Import Bank, um, Professor Omara. And also, I would like to mention two things. Taiwan has been regarded at the top 20 on the U.S. They depend on the core technology of Taiwan microchip. What 
take us into this uh, stage. Taiwan might be the perfect model of non oil economy. We have no his excellency cooperation between Taiwan and Edo State to promote agriculture and also information technology generated
Thank you very much, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The moment has come when we will be executing the memorandum of understanding between Afrexim Bank and the Charlie Strong Bankers of Nigeria. The president, while speaking, has said that the Africa should no longer be a begging nation, and that begins with education. So, on this note, please join me as I welcome up stage. of Afrexim Bank, our distinguished guest speaker today, the key of the MOU. I'd also like to invite, please let's give them a warm round of applause. The great sage, the greatest with which you can change the world is a barrister Peter Adeoju for the presentation of the MOU that will be executed. This MOU is to deepen capacity and knowledge of practitioners in the banking and finance industry in the area of trade and finance. And so, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to watch as the distinguished personalities here present execute this memorandum of understanding that will change the landscape in the training and certification of practitioners in the banking industry, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa as a whole. The distinguished presidents are signing, and I'm longest This is a great moment. This MOU will transform and shape the training and certification in the area of trade and finance. Thank you very much for signing. I'm unable to see from here who has a long signature, but I'm sure the cameraman can do that for me. We will exchange. Okay. So now invite the president of mind, and you now have the privilege of seeing who has the longest signature. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Let's celebrate this landmark achievement of the signing of this MOU. You can make it louder. If you're happy and excited, you can make it louder. History has not made of my take their way back to their seat and that is extremely good. thank you very much sir thank you sir. and now we the floor back to our distinguished master of ceremony thank you mr president mr president and chairman of so, may I humbly like you to please come back up stage and we do this very quickly. I'd like to invite President Orama back on stage. I'd like to invite Excellency, come off stage as the presenting. 
Your Excellency, please come on stage as we make this. On behalf of um, the Governing Council of the Chapter of the Bankers, we are quite excited for the and exciting presentation you did. To you, we want you to host this in your office in Cairo as a mark of appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. In the same vein, I'm on of today's occasion, Mr. Adedotu Suleiman. While I request His Excellency to please remain standing, Mr. Adedotu Suleiman, please come up stage, up stage for this quick presentation, sir. The President and Chairman of Council will present, make a presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much of today's event, the distinguished Nigerian professional executive consultant, and so on and so forth. All right. <laughs> so, on behalf of the Chinese Bankers, I hand this to you for for the honor you've given us, you know, to find time to join us here today and uh, for the remarks you made. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to request the office holders and the past presidents of CIB for group photo with the distinguished personalities on the top, on the podium. The office holders, the past presidents, to please step up for a group photograph with the president and chairman of council and the president of Africa in Bank. Yes, good evening. I'd like to only request the MD CEOs of the present, led by the chairman body of banks, Dr. Ebenezer Yaku, to please come on stage to have group photograph with the chairman and the president of the IBN, while the past presidents can make their way back to their states. The MD CEOs of banks here present to please come off stage. And then last but not the least, members of the governing council to immediately after this. Members of the governing council of CIBN, it's your show. Please come quickly for a group photograph with the distinguished personalities here. Sure.
Thank you very much. Members of the governing council, please flank here. And that's the last, there are more pictures after the event is uh, declared officially closed. But let's enjoy this moment as we take the last set of photographs. I'd like on the special request, the, His Excellency, the representative of Taiwan, please come up stage. Mr. Handy, Mr. Andy, please come up stage and have a quick photograph of this distinguished personality. Stand here before you. Mr. Andy, please come up stage quickly. This will be the last of the photographs before. Right. Your Excellency's distinguished guest. This will be the last set of photographs and we then swiftly. Thank you very much. Please help me appreciate this excellency and the distinguished guests as they make this, their way back to this set. Okay. No need. No need. You can use the press for the for. Thank you very much. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Let's give them a warm round of applause. On this note, I'd like to invite to give the vote of thanks and wrap up remarks the chairman of the organizing and planning committee of this great event. Please join me welcome the amazing Mrs. Neka Oyalikwe, FTIP, Group Managing Director of Fidelity Bank PLC. Please let me hear your resounding applause as she gives the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. The president, chairman of the council of CIB and my own Dr. Ken Opara, the chairman of the occasion of the two 2023 CIBN lecture today, Dr. Dotson Suleiman MFR, the distinguished guest of honor today of this lecture, Professor Benedict Okechupu uh, okay, Orama. CON FCIB. Please permit me to, dear distinguished um, ladies and gentlemen, and all special girls, permit me to, to stand uh, on existing protocols. As you can well see, the, the, the day is fast spent, so we want to make this speech very short so people can go to their various um, uh, places of employment. My role today is very easy. I'm, I actually have the easiest role today which is to deliver the vote of thanks. And like I said earlier, and I want to keep it very short because you have been away from your duty for a long time and we want to make sure that you're, you don't spend more time than you need to. Um, every year, CIBN holds this annual lecture to stimulate discourse around economic and societal issues. Through this platform, the institution has continued to widen the process of policy formulation and the development of transformational solutions to common challenges in Nigeria and across Africa. It has been of great pleasure and honor to serve as the chairman of this, of this annual lecture implementation committee. And I would like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to the team that worked with me on this. Today. Also, I trust that I had a very engaging session today because the, 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 uh, the professor or Rama was able to provide a lot of information on how policy formulation and support for the financial institutions can drive Africa's economic growth and transformation. And position us to one position Africa as one of the leading economics in the very detailed work and presentation and insightful lecture. And also to thank him for leading from the front in what he preaches, what he's preaching, because he has supported numerous institutions in Nigeria 
and in Africa, of which yours truly is a, a huge beneficiary. So we, we want to specifically thank him for walking his talk today. And I'm sure I'm speaking, uh, I'm, I'm speaking for the rest of the industry in Nigeria. I also want to thank very, uh, the chairman of this occasion, Dr. 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 Suleiman, for accepting this invitation. I'll be very late. Thank you, sir. I want to thank all my distinguished guests that made our time to come. Like I said, your time is very expensive and you spared time from your very busy day to spend time with us. We are very grateful. I also want to congratulate the CIBN for this very successful event, the Afro Exim, and, the, and the, 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 for the um, for, for the um, collaboration on the education and um, the formal signing of the of the um, the assistance to uh, to assist us with the economic development and building the academy. I want to congratulate the CIBN for all the effort they put together for today and to thank all of you once again for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can we do better than that? Can we put our hands together for uh, Mrs. Nika? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yes, um, now, now food is served, the hall is almost empty, Nigerians. Can we, can we just be a little bit uh, uh, together? We are running up like now. Can I invite Femi Kundaya for the uh, From a past president of CIBN, is here. It's Femi Kundaya, if you are here, good in prayer. Let us pray. Our Lord our God, we glorify your holy name because you started with us and you remain our companion. We thank you for the success of today's event. We also thank you for your the presence in the past of CIPA. Glory be to your holy name. As we depart to our various vocations, our Lord, you have had with us grant us protection, and we continue to guide all of those who control the affairs of nature, and your name will be glorified always. Thank you, Father, for your mighty name. Amen. Amen. I'm here, sir. Thank you so very much. So let's, let's wrap up completely with uh, the CIBN anthem as we wrap up the show. In to count, can we have the CIBN anthem while we say thank you? Anthem. I'm 
Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day. And thank you for being here with us. National Anthem. Okay, let's have a National Anthem to wrap up finally. The National Anthem. Uh -huh. On behalf of the CIBA, I want to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me so have a great day. My name is the Cape. See you again soon. No, we are we are we are we keep our word in today's fast paced high stakes make or break world you need every edge you can get to help your business succeed. That is why we've designed the new and improved Pro. We've made it even more flexible to adapt to your enterprise, no matter the size. And we've also created security to make your business transactions more secure. Now more than ever. You can now get even more done. Get the extra edge to see as bills for your business. Visit sterling.ng slash pro and let's get your business ahead. They say that love with baby steps from the moment you are born to your very first lessons and as time passes our path towards the future is defined by the people we encounter along the way the moments shared and trusted advice that guides us through this journey taking us from where we are to where we ought to be Trusted advice transforms dreams.
Thank you. 